200 years ago, Frederick Blumenbach was captivated by human chin, something that most people would not even notice. To him, it was one of the most remarkable features that sets us apart from other primates. While other traits like big brains, grasping fingers and upright walking can be seen in our extinct ancestors, the chin seems to be uniquely human. Welcome to Anthromedia. In this video, we will delve into the evolution of chin, exploring whether it is an adaptation or simply an evolutionary remnant. If you enjoy our content, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Your continuous encouragement is what motivates us to keep making more videos like this. The chin is a bony prominence located at the anterior aspect of the lower jaw, called mandibular symphysial. The salient features of the symphysial region are a raised central keel that flows into a distended lower margin a low-lying triangular mental tuberosity at the confluence of the keel and the inferior margin. The mental fossae that lie on either side of the keel and above the distended lower margin. The shape of the chin is a significant characteristic that distinguishes humans from other primates. The shape of the human chin is established during the fetal development and remains unchanged into adulthood. Neanderthals did not have this distinctive chin shape and, therefore, mandible was broad and accurate. Some fossils that are typically classified as Homo sapiens display the human-like chin shape, while others have no distinctive features. There are six different hypotheses about the origin of human chin, three of which suggest that it is a spandrel, meaning it's a byproduct of other development, while the other three propose that it is an adaptation, meaning it is developed as a response to specific circumstances. Spandrels are accidental byproducts resulting from genetic drift or indirect effects of selection on a complex structure. The spandrel hypothesis suggests that the chin is not adaptive but rather a byproduct of reduced prognathism. Let's discuss the explanations one by one. Three spandrel hypotheses are presented here. The hypofunction hypothesis, the airway impingement hypothesis, and the self-domestication hypothesis. The hypofunction hypothesis suggests that the reduction of dental size led to a reduction in the size of alveolar process, ultimately resulting in the emergence of the chin. The hypofunction hypothesis asserts that the mandible and associated teeth underwent a dramatic reduction in use, particularly among later homo due to cooking and pre-oral food processing. Reduced demands on the masticatory apparatus gradually led to a reduction in dental and mandibular proportions, resulting in the chin. However, there are still some problems with this hypothesis and more research is needed to establish a direct link between dental reduction and the chin emergence. The central issue is why the basal mandible did not undergo a similar reduction in size. Researchers supporting the hypothesis rely on ontogeny, citing superior to inferior growth cessation gradient, possibly experiencing differential speeds of evolutionary reduction. However, ontogeny does not always accurately reflect evolutionary history. Therefore, there is still much to be learned about the evolution of the chin. The self-domestication hypothesis suggests that the emergence of modern behavior and increased social tolerance in humans was mediated by lowered androgen levels, which led to facial gracilization and mid-facial retraction. The reduction in androgen levels during development also results in less aggressive adults. As a byproduct of mid-facial retraction, chin emerged due to retraction of mandibular alveolar process. However, there are potential issues with the self-domestication hypothesis, including the fact that dogs, which also exhibit facial gracilization, do not have chins, and, and males tend to have higher levels of androgens and larger chins than females. 
The hypotheses provide possible explanation for the evolution of human chin, but further research is needed to fully understand this aspect of human evolution. The airway impingement hypothesis proposes that a shorter upper jaw and bipedal posture can cause airway constriction during jaw opening. The chin may have evolved to keep their tongue away from the narrow airway in humans, but this does not explain the thick bone in the mandible. Neanderthals and other chinless hominins may have needed a chin to avoid airway constriction due to their greater prognathism. However, the distance between the tongue and chin makes this hypothesis uncertain. Elongating the chin may also be adaptive in certain contexts, such as in response to changes in diet or social behavior. The masticatory citrus hypothesis emphasizes features of the human chin and how it may have evolved to help with chewing. Some scientists believe that the chin is adopted to withstand the citrus of biting and chewing, specifically the strain caused by wishbone. However, the human mandible is shaped differently than other animals, which means wishbone is not a major factor in the citrus on the jaw. Instead, the chin may be adopted to resist coronal bending, which creates different types of strains that require more bone to resist. Even though bone does not always respond perfectly to the demands of the body, the chin's placement is not efficient for resisting coronal bending. The evolution of chin occurred after the discovery of cooking, which led to a diet of softer foods, and there is evidence that Homo erectus also cooked food, but had no chin. Contrary to what the hypothesis would predict, there are in fact indications that with regard to possible chewing functions, the chin is overbuilt. Analysis of chin's functional performance have shown that human synthesis is unlikely to be adopted to mitigate wishboning citruses. The speech hypothesis proposes that human chin is a result of mechanical citrus generated during speech. When humans speak, the jaw moves up and down, while the tongue is rapidly positioned in the oral cavity to articulate word sounds. The genioglossus muscle, which is responsible for tongue movement, attaches to the lower portion of the lingual surface of the symphysis opposite the chin and may have led to the development of chin through low magnitude stress of high frequency. Different researchers have slightly different variations of this hypothesis, but generally agree that speech created a need for buttressing outside the oral cavity, resulting in the development of chin. However, there are theoretical and empirical gaps in this hypothesis. While speech is unique to humans, the mechanical effects associated with speech are not necessarily unique. Additionally, if chins were necessary for frequent and consistent articulation of word sounds, it implies that none of the extinct hominins were capable of articulating speech. However, the complexity of their societies and their use of complex and frequent vocal communication suggests otherwise. In summary, the speech hypothesis has some flaws and does not completely explain the evolution of human chin. Some anthropologists have suggested that the chin is a marker of social dominance and genetic quality while others have proposed that males may use female chins as a marker of fertility. However, there are at least two related problems with using differences in male and female chin shape as evidence of sexual selection hypothesis. Firstly, chin shape and chin presence are conceptually separate, and evidence of dimorphism in chin shape or evidence of chin shape being used as a sexual marker is not an evidence that chin presence was sexually selected. The chin itself may have arisen for some other reasons, only later to have its exterior shape accepted into a marker for sexual identity. Secondly, both males and females have chins. 
which is significant because the vast majority of sexually selected characters occur in only one sex. Therefore, in order to explain chins as a sexually selected ornament, either humans are exceptional among mammals in possessing a monomorphic sexual ornament or chins are sexually signaling adaptations in only one of the sexes with the appearance of chin in other sex being the result of genetic co-variation and potentially making the chins of one of the sexes as a spandrel. As yet, there is no good evidence of either scenario. In a recent article, drinking has been proposed as a possible explanation. The act of drinking is important for mammals but also puts them in a vulnerable position for attack from predators on land and in water. Humans are the only living animals that drink from cupped hands, which is an efficient technique enabled by bipedalism. The possession of a chin enhances this advantage by minimizing obstruction of our view while drinking. This efficient drinking method would also have been advantageous in stalking and hunting prey through long distance endurance running, as humans hunt primarily with their sense of sight. The evolution of chin around 2 lakh years ago enabled Homo sapiens to maintain their advantage of a watchtower vantage point while drinking, just as bipedalism increased hominins' field of vision 5 million years ago. As more and more hominid fossils are discovered and studied, the significance of chin morphed into something more evolutionary rather than a mere distinguishing feature, instead of being stagnant characteristic of specially created organisms, morphological features such as chin became to be incorporated into tantalizing evolutionary scenarios that sought to explain the complex process of human evolution. For paleoanthropologists, the real puzzle was how an ape-like jaw could have evolved into the significant mandible of Homo sapiens. Overall, the study of chin is an ongoing and complex area of research that involves understanding both the anatomical and genetic factors that contribute to its development, as well as the functional and evolutionary roles that it may play. While adaptationist proposals have been more prevalent in literature, there is still much to be discovered about the potential spandrel hypothesis and other non-adoptive factors that may contribute to the presence and form of the chin. Thank you for watching.